In the heart of the Deep South, a waitress feeds a black homeless man. When he leaves, she discovers who he really is and screams in terror, knowing full well that her kind act is going to open a can of worms. The diner clock glared at Constance. 2.03 AM. Another graveyard shift. Her worn sneakers barely counted as shoes anymore, and her feet already ached. A fresh pot of coffee sputtered behind her, its bitter scent doing nothing to cut the thick haze of old grease. The door creaked open. The discordant chime sliced through the quiet hum. An elderly black man shuffled inside. His clothes were ragged, and his gaze was fixed on the floor. The overnight regulars, a trucker nursing his fourth refill and a bleary-eyed couple locked in a silent argument, watched his entrance with a mix of disgust and weariness. Whispers rose like steam from overfilled mugs. Constance approached the man. With a practiced smile, she asked him if he wanted to sit at a table or the counter. He simply asked for a cup of black coffee. She poured a mug. A familiar pang of pity flickered in her chest. It shouldn't matter, but it did. He was the wrong color in this greasy nowhere, and her gut told her that making a fuss would cost her more than spare change. She glanced back at the table. Eyes bored into her, telling her to turn around and leave that black homeless man alone. Yet as she surveyed the untouched plates cluttering the counter, defiance bubbled up hot and unexpected. Screw them, she thought. She snatched up a half-eaten stack of pancakes. She returned to the man. On the way, she added a side of bacon scavenged from a forgotten order. It was on the house, she said. The man's shoulders straightened just a fraction. Surprise flickered across his lined face. Then, slowly, he lowered himself into a cracked vinyl booth. He ate, each bite slow and deliberate. His tension seemed to melt away. Constance felt it too, a warmth spreading despite the chill of the diner. It was a victory born of leftovers, a tiny blow against the judging eyes and the crushing weariness that had become her life. As the last bits of bacon disappeared, the man pushed his plate aside. His eyes were no longer clouded by hunger. He told her generosity like she had displayed was rare these days. Then Carter reached into the pocket of his threadbare coat and pulled out a crumpled bill that even in the dim light, Constance recognized as a hundred dollars. He slid it across the worn counter together with a faded business card. For your trouble, he said, his voice barely a whisper. I'll be back to see you soon. And with that, he walked through the doors and disappeared into the outside world. She wondered why a homeless man had a business card and held it to the light to read the name on the torn piece of paper. That's when it hit her a cold jolt of recognition. She remembered Lawrence Carter from when his worn face flickered on newscast. When she was just a small child, he was a grainy mugshot plastered on storefront windows. The accused, the fugitive, the man with a price on his head. Apparently, he had single-handedly turned a peaceful protest into a brutal attack against the city and its politicians, leaving blood and fear in his wake. She screamed softly as terror ripped through her. Panic spiked in her chest. Why would he come back for her? Was that a threat? If she reported him, would the police think they were friends and brand her a criminal as well? By the time her shift neared its end, each shadow became Carter's stooped figure. Each rustle of wind sounded like approaching sirens. The first regular shuffled in. Constance's nerves were frayed. And still, she plastered on her practice smile and poured the endless coffee with her every sense on high alert. But Carter didn't return. The sun rose and customers cycled through, yet the disquiet that gnawed at her only deepened. Finally, exhaustion won over fear. She slumped in a back booth on her break and fished out the business card he'd given her with the hundred dollars. It felt heavier now. The once anonymous name blazed with accusation. Dr. Lawrence Carter. Images flickered through her mind. She remembered history textbooks from a school she barely finished, and snippets of old documentaries her father used to watch. Carter hadn't just been a professor, he'd been a civil rights firebrand in the 60s. Then, the accusations came. The protests went wrong. 
and the grainy police mugshot followed, the one that still haunted the city's collective memory. The diner's phone was an ancient rotary model that collected dust between the register and the pie display. It rang loudly. She usually ignored it, but the relentless ringing jangled her already frayed nerves. She answered tiredly. The person on the other side introduced herself as Detective Eleanor Barnes from the Mobile Police Department, and she said they needed to talk about a man called Lawrence Carter. She added that an informant had told them he was in the diner during the small hours of the morning. Constance's world turned eerily silent. The clattering of plates and the hiss of the grill faded as if abruptly muted. She swallowed again and promised to come down to the station once her shift ended. The police station wasn't as she'd imagined it from countless cop shows. Instead of harsh interrogation rooms and flickering fluorescence, Detective Barnes' office was surprisingly tidy. The detective herself was mid-forties, with short, no-nonsense hair and a gaze that seemed to bore straight through Constance. She thanked her for coming in and then repeated she wanted to talk about Lawrence Carter. Constance recounted the night's events. When she finished, the silence in the office was thick enough to choke on. Detective Barnes asked Constance if she realized she had assisted a fugitive. The interrogation dragged on. Constance felt stripped bare. Her meager life was dissected under the unyielding gaze of the detective. The guilt, fear, and the lingering flicker of sympathy warred within her. Was the Carter she'd met the same man vilified on the news? The gentle old man with haunted eyes seemed worlds apart from the fiery young revolutionary and the accused criminal. Detective Barnes leaned forward. Her expression softened a fraction. Then she told Constance she realized she was caught in the crossfire on this one and that she was free to go. However, she wanted her to call if he ever showed up at the diner. That $100 bill suggested he was either robbing people or receiving support from someone who knew where to find him. Constance shuddered. It seemed her simple act of kindness had snagged her in a net designed for far bigger fish, leaving her feeling small and scared. She stumbled out of the police station. Her head throbbed and relentless questions jackhammered in her mind. Should she turn on Carter? What would she do if he returned to the diner? Warn him or call the police? For Constance, the diner was a sanctuary of greasy familiarity, but now it felt suffocating. As customers trickled in, she kept busy, but her thoughts were a chaotic hurricane. People were whispering about the incident and soon enough, the whole town was reminiscing about that day. Some people were convinced that Carter had done it on purpose. He had incited people for hours, pushing them to turn on each other. But others believed he had simply been caught in a crossfire, much like Constance herself. He had organized that protest with peace in his mind. Someone had blamed him when everything had gone south. What did she think about it? She'd been too young when the protest had taken place and she didn't remember what her teachers had said about it in school. If she'd been older or more attentive, would she have taken his side or the authorities? The memory of Carter's tired eyes and his story spilling out under the diner's lonely lights made Constance realize there was only one way she could make up her mind once and for all. When a lull finally hit, she slipped out the back door. She'd have to find Carter, get some answers, and pray there was a way out of this mess. Mobile's homeless population wasn't exactly invisible, but Constance was shocked by the sheer number of souls haunting the city's underbelly. Asking questions led mostly to suspicious glares and dismissive shrugs. Just as she was about to give up, a figure hunched under a discarded tarp caught her eye. She called out Carter's name, her voice barely above a whisper. The fear was back, gnawing at her, but so was an adrenaline-fueled determination. The figure stirred, then slowly sat up. Carter squinted at her, the recognition a mix of surprise and a wariness that cut deep. You shouldn't be here, he rasped. This is no place for a decent woman. She bit her teeth and told him she had questions, that the police had asked her questions, and that she needed to know the truth. Carter sighed. It was a sound full of a lifetime of weariness. And what will you do with that truth, child? He asked, 
sell it to the highest bidder? Constance shook her head vigorously. She told him the police might think he'd paid her for her silence, that the hundred dollars was to buy her cooperation. She also told him she couldn't make up her mind, and that was why she wanted him to tell her the truth. Did they frame him? Was he innocent or not? The questions hung in the stale air of the alleyway. Carter averted his gaze and stared down at his hands. They were worn and scarred, yet surprisingly gentle-looking. Doesn't matter if I'm innocent or not, he finally said. The system decided my guilt long ago. The truth is, that's all that counts. They sat in silence, surrounded by the unseen, unheard lives of the city. At that moment, Constance felt more lost, more broken than she ever had. The image of Carter huddled in the alley and his quiet resignation burned into her memory. They framed me, he eventually said. Carter's words hit Constance like a cold slap. Not cops, no, he said. People far more powerful. The kind who don't dirty their hands, but they have blood on them nonetheless. Made it look like I'd lost control, that I'd turned a peaceful movement into... He trailed off, disgust etched into his features. She asked why. Carter now had a revolutionary glint in his eyes. He told her it was because he spoke the truth, and those powerful people couldn't find another way to silence him. He rallied disenfranchised people around him. That made a person dangerous, especially if that person couldn't be bought or broken. Then Carter sank back into a spot close to the fire. He told her how they destroyed his name and his family, but failed to extinguish his spark. So, he said, he hid in plain sight, and he ended by saying he was waiting to strike back, not with violence, but with the unwavering power of truth. A deafening crack shattered the fragile stillness. It wasn't gunfire, something heavier, more menacing, she thought briefly. Constance whirled to see figures in black swarming into the camp, not uniforms, but the chilling efficiency of a well-oiled machine. Carter shouted at her to run, but Constance stood frozen, transfixed by the cold brutality unfolding before her. Tents were ripped open, meager belongings were scattered, desperate cries were choked off by rough hands. Constance, they followed you, Carter shouted. His voice was urgent and snapped her out of her horrified trance. They're here for me. Go, he shoved her away. Constance ran blindly. Her feet pounded dirt paths with the echoes of gunfire and ragged screams spurring her on. She burst through the undergrowth. The city lights seemed a world away. Breath tore at her lungs, and just as she stumbled onto a cracked sidewalk, a scream pierced the night. It was her own. Pain ripped through her shoulder. A fiery shockwave knocked her to the ground. The world tilted crazily, then faded into blessed blackness. Constance awoke to the sterile glare of hospital lights and the lingering echo of her own scream in her memory. Every breath ached. Her arm throbbed in an uncomfortable cast. A grim-faced detective Barnes stood by her bedside. She told Constance they got Carter, and the elusive wording was enough to clear the fog from her mind. Who? she asked. Who got Carter? The police? Barnes didn't reply immediately. Instead, she fished out a crumpled business card from her pocket. Constance recognized it instantly. The faded ink, Carter's name. But it wasn't the card itself that chilled her. It was the scrawl across the back. Just a name. Senator Winslow. Constance knew who he was. The man was a bigot and a liar, a narcissistic caricature who always seemed to get away with everything, a pillar of the community, he liked to think, a smiling face on billboards. Yet the power in that hastily written name was as cold and lethal as any gun. Detective Barnes watched her. A flicker of something resembling respect flashed in her eyes. The fight never ends, Constance, she said softly. It just changes shape. Six months later, Constance remembered those words. Something had indeed changed shape in those months. The town, without a doubt, and her life as well. Constance didn't work at the diner anymore. Her days were now filled with interviews and hastily scribbled speeches. 
Her stubborn determination echoed that of the man she was waiting for. Carter's name wasn't a stain anymore. Under her guidance, and with the support of Detective Barnes, it had become a rallying cry again. A symbol of change, no matter how hard won. That day, the detective had explained to Constance that they'd been cooperating with Carter in secret for years. He had always suspected the identity of the person who had incited the protest and put the blame on him to discredit his community work, but he'd never had enough proof for the police to intervene. However, the attack on the homeless camp had been sloppy, and Detective Barnes' team had been able to find some clues. Clues that had led them directly to Senator Winslow's doorstep. The prison gates were an ugly scar on the bright morning. They had tried to break him to silence his story, but now it was Constance's turn. She had transformed his suffering into a weapon against the very injustice that sought to snuff him out. Months ago, she had picked up where Carter had left off. The endless rallies, television appearances, letters, and petitions to the Department of Justice had all paid off. The pressure was just too much for them to ignore. Eventually, Senator Winslow was impeached. His power was now broken, and he was facing criminal charges. The days of the bigoted, narcissistic Senator Winslow and his cabal were numbered. The prison gates creaked open, and there he stood. Carter was older and thinner than before. His eyes were etched with exhaustion, but they were unbroken. Constance met his gaze, and in that unspoken exchange, a promise passed between them. The fight had only just begun. What a great ending! Do you have a story of someone who helped a person on the fringes of society? Tell us in the comments, we'd love to hear. For now, that's it for us. We'll catch you in the next video.